Uh, how long should I have been in this? Uh, figure if we each do 20 minutes, yeah, okay. then, so I mean, then we'll have plenty of time. And who knows, maybe <laughs> one of the other guys will come in late or something. Sounds good. So we're going to get started. Uh, this is a panel on Marxism and Marxist historically. My name is Manuel Yang. I'm a part-time instructor at Bowling Green State University. And this is Brendan Hennessy from the University of California, Los Angeles. And I'm talking today about uh, E.P. Thompson, Yoshimura Takaaki, and Anglo-Japanese Marxism. I should start by talking about my trip to Japan last year because uh, I did my most, of, most of my master's essay and dissertation on Yoshimura Takaaki. His name is not really well recognized in the United States, but uh, in Japanese intellectual history, he's probably arguably the most important post-war Japanese thinker. And uh, the reason I contrast him with E.P. Thompson is because he was born, they were both born the same year, 1924. And so the war, uh, World War II, had a huge impact, seminal impact on both of their formation as intellectuals and thinkers and, and activists and et cetera. And they both had a very seminal influence in turn on the new left in the 1960s. And their writings have become obviously, at least in the case of Thompson, internationally acclaimed and very much a foundation stone, so to speak, of uh, not just Marxist thinking, but social history in general. And uh, both of them are interested in the roots of what is indigenous to their respective countries, England and Japan. Uh, as you may know, the debates that the Thompson had with people like Perry Anderson back in the 60s had to do with the fact that uh, what is peculiar to the English tradition, I mean, that particular essay that Thompson, the peculiarities of the English, was uh, <coughs> a way for him to try to reclaim the radical tradition in England going all the way back to the 1640s with the English Revolution, levelers, diggers, and so on. His own study in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, William Morris, and of course, uh, his is probably the most famous book that he did, Making the English Working Class. In Yoshimoto's case, um, he, his work also dealt with the indigenous tradition in Japan, but in a radically different way. Um, he was born, as I said, in 1924. So when the war ended, he was about 21 years old. As a typical work, he was a working class kid from this small section of Tokyo. And he uh, inherited a lot of the traits of that particular locality and geography, meaning that uh, most of the working class kids were smart enough. They went to technical schools. And he did not go to the elite institutions like Tokyo University and so on, which the equivalents of Harvard, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, and so on. And so his own thinking about the war was very much pro-war, like many workers in Japan, most of the workers, with very, virtually no exception. And they justified their own allegiance to the, to the war on the basis of the emperor. The emperor was something worth dying for. Uh, and when Yoshimoto faced the defeat of the war in 1945, he was thrown into this state of despair, disillusionment, because he realized when the U.S. occupation came in that uh, the U.S. occupiers were nothing like the propaganda. As the Japanese state used to say, kichikube, meaning English, British, and American demons and beasts, that they were just going to come into the country and just wait to all the women, which didn't happen. So he had to rethink a lot of his ideas from the roots. Uh, but one of the things he never did, and and never have done, is to have any kind of sympathy at all with the Communist Party of Japan. Because as soon as 1945 hit, uh, few imprisoned Communist Party members in Japan came out and they started to organize workers and whatnot. But Yoshimura was turned off by the Communist Party for uh, their complete uh, neglect or rejection of the Japanese workers' consciousness, if you will, during the war. Yes, they were deluded, if you will, ideologically speaking, but they did fight for uh, what they were th thought was very, very important reasons. Uh, this kind of, I think, attitude is very much similar to what Thompson says in the preface to the Making the English Working Class, right? Where he says, my, my, my job is to, to rescue from condescension the stock, you know, poor stockinger, the Lodite cropper, et cetera, et cetera. Even the deluded uh, disciple of Johannes Sauskar, the millenarian sect at that time. People who are completely relegated to the margins or considered deluded reactionary by the Marxist orthodoxy. The difference is Thompson comes out of the Marxist orthodoxy. His brother, Frank Thompson, 
who was also a, mil a soldier in World War II, just like Thompson himself, uh, was initially, he sort of led the, you know, sort of family member-wise. His father was a, a liberal minister, Methodist minister, anti-imperialist, friends of Nehru, Gandhi, and so on. But his brother became a party member, and Thompson felt free that he could also do the same. So for him, World War II was a, a war against fascism, a popular war against fascism, first and foremost. And in the post-war period from 45 all the way to 1956, Thompson was an active member at the grassroots level, uh, extramural teacher, tutor, meaning that he was teaching working class. Working class education became generalized in England. He was one of the teachers for that particular uh, educational reform. And, but in 56, of course, Thompson, like many other Marxists in Britain or Europe and other parts of the world, experienced a sense of uh, uh, necessity to break from the party because of the Hungarian uprising, which was suppressed by the Soviet teams coming in when they were the Hungarian revolutionaries wanted uh, a, hum a socialism of human face, right? socialist humanism. And of course, with the, uh, the de-Stalinization process at the start of Khrushchev's speech at the 20th Congress. So for Thompson, this break uh, opened up what he called the moment of commencement for reason. He started to reason for the first time. And under the banner of uh, socialist humanism, right? So his, uh, the journal that he edited with his uh, colleagues were called New Reason, because the Reasoner was a journal internal to the Communist Party dissenting against the uh, orthodoxy uh, from within to try to reform it. When he thought, and his colleagues thought this was impossible, 56, he founds a new journal called New Reason. And this becomes an opening salvo, if you will, of the British New Left. And then later, the University Left Review, that merges and becomes the New Left Review. Again, I think the contrast with Yoshimoto is very striking. In the case of Japan, the Communist Party was much in intellectual prominence up until, let's say, the early 60s. Because as soon as the war ended, there was a, all kinds of organization that just sprouted from all over the country. We're talking about trade unions also, but cooperatives, uh, student unions on a national scale was organized, the Zengakuren, which became legendary mythical as soon as 1960 hit, because that was the year in which the biggest demonstration in Japan took place against the Japanese diet, the government. Why? Because there was a renewal between the US and Japan security pact. And uh, at the time, the Prime Minister, Kishinobusuke, said, we're not going to allow opposition party members to vote on this. So he called in the police and kicked out socialists and communists from voting. A completely anti-democratic act. And this really pissed off a lot of the general population, including the students who led the most militant uh, elements of that demonstration. If you know anything about the 60s and uh, struggle in Japan, if you might have heard of the snake marchers, that's where it came from. Well, the Communist Party denounced the students as Trotskyist provocateurs. And the reason was they wanted to have a sort of very, very kowtowing march to the Diet, saying thank you to the police, petitioning a, a really ridiculous uh, kind of a, a demo, limited, constricted. And for the last uh, 10 years or so, every time there was an eruption of a militant struggle from the students or workers, the party tended to really uh, squelch it, not control it under its own ideological stranglehold. The students got fed up. And the Sengakure, this uh, National Student Union, was a sort of a, a place where all these different elements who were dissenting against the old Orthodox, old left Communist Party were coming into being. So you had, yes, Trotskyists, you had anarchists, you had people who were not particularly politically affiliated. And that's when Yoshimoto comes into being as a prominent uh, intellectual, because most of the intellectuals at that time, left wing and so on, sided with the party, critical of the students. But Yoshimoto were one of the two or very handful intellectuals who stood up on the side of the students. And this really won huge accolade and support among the students, and then for the next 10 years he would become the figure which would uh, inspire what's called the non-sectarian elements of the radical new left. Well, that was in the 1960s. And uh, through the 1970s and 80s, as you know, uh, Thompson also goes into a different kind of direction. In the 70s, Thompson is doing research in Warwick uh, concerning uh, the commons. The commons is this particular tradition you have in England, but all over the world, where uh, peasants and fishermen and people who live in a so-called pre-industrial society share things communally, traditionally, under feudal 
uh, rights and so on and so forth. And what Thompson wanted to do was to rescue this, again, just like he did from the Stockingers and the Lodite Croppers, from condescension. Try to find what was so actively uh, imaginative about these particular practices. Because in the 70s, we're talking about a period of uh, uh, increasing capitalist crisis. But at the same time, we treat a movement. And I think Thompson's consciousness was sort of trying to seek a way to go back into history to find some examples that become some prefiguration for the future. Well, in Yoshimoto's case, he went in a different direction. Because in 1968, Yoshimoto uh, published his most important book, which at least theoretically at that particular moment, which was a book called uh, Kyodo Gensoro, The Theory of Communal Illusion. This was his, the ultimate confrontation he was going to have with the Japanese state that deluded him during the war, that completely enthralled him. And he realized the problem was when you, in order to understand the power and potency of the Japanese emperor system, you have to go to the, the, uh, the customary practices of the Japanese, to the roots of indigenous Shinto, what we would consider shamanistic. They're very similar to Native American practices. In different localities in Japan, if you go look at festivals and, and uh, different rituals, they're disparate. There's no unified sense. But in the early modern, particularly after the Meiji modernization, that became all completely centralized at least in terms of the centralization of the Shinto shrine and so on. So Yoshimura was trying to find a way in which how this sort of power of the emperor became so potent. And uh, one of the things he deciphered was because Japan uh, was rooted in these different customs and mythologies and what you will, and how and every time there was a, any kind of ruling hegemony, these state powers tended to effectively utilize it to organize uh, the country. Uh, in order to really deal with this, you had to deal with the, the ways in which uh, Japanese tradition was still alive within Japanese capitalism, okay? Because going, this is kind of going to the heart of uh, the title of my uh, presentation. Japanese Marxism in the 20th century revolved around the question of whether or not Japan was, after the Meiji period, 1868, is it capitalist or is it semi-capitalist or semi-feudal? Uh, this was a split debate between the Kozaha, the lecture school, thought which are much more orthodox in orientation. They tended to say, no, no, we need a bourgeois revolution, following through a communist party line at that time. Uh, because there was a restoration in 1868. And if you don't overthrow the, of the emperor, you can't have a real bourgeois revolution. So you need to have a full-on bourgeois revolution. Well, the other side, the Rono and the farmer labor faction said, no, no, you, what you have to have is a socialist revolution. Because in 1868, what was signal was Japan had become fully modernized. And the emperor was simply something just on the surface of things. And so this debate went on and on. I mean, and they were, the, in a way, the pioneers of Japanese social science in the 30s and so on, 20s and 30s. Because for the first time, uh, Japanese sociologists, economists were utilizing texts and documents to prove an empirical point about history. Well, that was very important. But by 1945, when the war ended, this particular debate got revived because a lot of these people got in prison or they uh, shifted their sympathy during the war to, to the Japanese wartime state. It almost became completely irrelevant. Uh, and for Yoshimura, the point of departure was that uh, Japanese capitalism, any kind of capitalism, could have this dual uh, power, so to speak. And there was no contradiction thereof. There was no such thing as pure capitalism. Uh, this was, in a way, goes back to the debate between Perry Anderson and, and uh, E.P. Thompson, right? Because uh, Anderson's critique of the English system was simply that it was not as full of a bourgeois revolution as the French model in terms of intellectual culture because you still had the residues of uh, the class system, polite culture, all of that. And that retarded, according to Anderson's point of view, the intellectual radicalism that could have uh, fomented more an activist labor movement, to which, of course, Thompson took exception. So this kind of goes back to these questions about what exactly is the source of, uh, of, of, of capitalism in England and Japan as well. Uh, I think the most important thing to take away though from both Thompson and Yoshimoto are not just these thematics, which we can talk about more, but I'll just limit myself to those things. Uh, the most important thing is that both of these figures, uh, Thompson, it's really hard to describe him as an academic because he was an activist first and foremost. When he, he did go to Warwick University in the late 60s, early 70s, and he taught uh, this new school of uh, 
social history called Warwick School, which did the study of the commons and re studied crime from the perspective of the working class. But Thompson felt that when that scholarly research was done, it was time for him in the late 70s, early 80s to become an anti-nuclear activist. And he, he left his scholarly activities uh, on the side, just like when he was an activist in the 50s. Uh, he was very much committed to that, even though he was teaching on the side as well. Well, in Shimona's case, I think you can say the same thing, at least, uh, or at least more so, that he was not an academic intellectual in any sense whatsoever. Uh, he didn't have an academic position ever. Uh, the only time he lectured, and he lectured massive numbers of times, was when the students, uh, when occupying the schools and so on, they invited him to give a talk. So over the years, there's been hundreds and hundreds of talks that he's given. And uh, this kind of uh, relationship to the, the public outside of academia is very peculiar for radical intellectuals in Japan. Most of Marxists or communists, uh, traditionally speaking in Japan, have been affiliated with elite institutions. For example, until the 70s, Tokyo University, sort of the equivalent of Harvard and so on, uh, the economics department had 50%, up to 50% of the faculty members were Marxists. But Marxists were teaching graduate students or students to become members of Ministry of Finance, bureaucrats, right? Because for them, Marxism was a method to uh, develop capitalism uh, under, of course, social democratic means and so on, because uh, this was a moment that they thought when a socialist revolution was not imminent, so what you can best do is to try to analyze capitalism the best you can and try to apply that. And that kind of instrumentalist use of Marxism, uh, Yoshimura had no sympathy for. And Yoshimura never called himself a Marxist for this reason. Because in Japan, if you call yourself a Marxist, it meant that you had some affiliation with a political party or sect or uh, ideological dogmatism, which he completely rejected. So he often called himself a Marx person. Mark Marx shots, meaning a person who wanted to do what Marx person wanted to do for the 20th century, what Marx did for the 19th. And this attitude you can see also in Thompson later in his life, uh, in his polemic against Al Jazeera, for example. Uh, he says uh, that uh, the point is not that you are a Marxist. The point is that Marx is on your side, on our side, and we argue with him, which is exactly what he did in his work on customs and common, uh, or in his work on making the English working class, because he was arguing with that sort of base superstructure, mechanical model that a lot of the lot of the Marxists picked up and imposed willy-nilly on the working class as a whole. But to, to kind of sum this up very quickly, uh, the reason both Thompson and, and Yoshimoto could maintain this intellectual independence, uh, integrity, I believe, has something to do with that idiom, that particular term that Thompson used in his vocabulary quite often, which is the term experience. And that seems under-theorized from the perspective of, let's say, the continental European perspective. But for him, experience meant that uh, you had to ground yourself, not just in empirical documents as a historian, but also in the actual experiences and struggles of what was taking place at that time. You know, and his, his own experience of the war had a radical basis for his own scholarship, his own thinking. And every step of the way, the anti-nuclear movement, too, when he was an activist, he spoke in the language of William Blake, because Blake was in his blood. And his tradition of the 1790s, the freeborn Englishman, going back to the 1640s, that was still alive as he was speaking against the Thatcherite regime. And with, Ta with uh, Yoshimoto, this is very similar as well. For him, experience was absolutely critical in the sense that his own experience of the war, his, that defeat, he had to digest it. He was not satisfied with a lot of the Japanese intellectuals, left or right, who wanted to just incorporate Western ideas and Westernize. And and think or delude themselves, that was the pinnacle of intellectual cosmopolitanism. But that you had, every question that you asked had to have some kind of existential uh, basis for it. And for this reason, he sort of went in a different direction in the 80s and 90s when he started to become much more sympathetic to the development as in, op in, in contrast to his erstwhile new left comrades towards Japanese consumerism, for example, which he thought was a very important uh, development, that this was when the masses, or the word to use is word taishu, the people actually walked into the realm of culture, when pure literature, uh, jumungaku, had become less and less, mar more and more marginalized, and popular culture has become the basis of uh, uh, human thought, human interactions. And he really recognized the positive aspect of this, much more so than Thompson would have done. 
But uh, I think it is really important for us to remember that any kind of relationship that we have towards Marxism or towards any body of thought, whether it's Michel Foucault, Deleuze, or anybody, uh, is really meaningless and, in a way, finally academically sterile unless we have this experiential, existential relationship to it. Thank you. All right. Um, my name is Brendan Hennessy. I'm a grad student at UCLA in the Department of Italian Studies. Um, in a lot of ways, I think our papers sort of link up. We're talking about the same period. Um, and also, I'm going to be talking about Lucchino Visconti, who is a uh, communist filmmaker in Italy uh, after the war. And in many ways, he was a, you know, a, a Marxist outside the institution, uh, kind of a non-party guy. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is really the, the reception of Gramsci, the early reception of Gramsci in Italy. Um, I'm going to really talk about one section um, of Gramsci's literary criticism, and where I see it is that as being influential on um, Italian cinema in, in the post-war. And so, just to give you a little bit of a, of a um, picture of who Visconti was, um, he was a major filmmaker in Italy. He never really had that much uh, popularity outside of Italy uh, for a number of reasons, really until, well actually until the 1970s when he starts to make movies um, set in Germany. But um, he was part of the Italian neorealism, which um, right following the war, uh, neorealism was a cinematic movement that really saw social realism as a way to make films that they were counter to the fascist aesthetic um, of cinema in that they dealt with, uh, you know, normal people and their struggles following during Reconstruction. Um, I mean, you may have seen Bicycle Thieves or Paisa, films by Rossellini, um, by De Sica, and Visconti, uh, he has a really interesting relationship with the movement because he's seen as both kind of a precursor to it in a film that he makes in 1941 called Ossessione Obsession, uh, which is really great. It's about, um, it's based on a James N. Cain novel, The Postman Always Rings Twice. Um, but it's a very subtle commentary on uh, Italian fascism in rural areas um, that was made under fascism, which was interesting. And then he makes a 1948 uh, film called The Earth Quakes or The Earth Trembles, um, in which he depicts the life of a small uh, Sicilian village of fishermen. And the entire film is done in this very remote uh, Sicilian dialect. And so uh, when the film came out in Italy, they had to have subtitles, and there's a voiceover as well. But anyways, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the situation in Italy following neorealism, which, I mean, the main dates for neorealism go from about 45 until 52. Now, neorealism sort of, as a genre, lives on after that. But by 1950, it's really kind of looking, Italians were looking for a new cinematic aesthetic. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of context about where Italian cinema was um, in the late 40s, early 50s, basically you have, it's entirely dominated by Hollywood films. And there are a few different reasons for that. And, I mean, in 1949 you had, of all the ticket sales in Italy, 75% uh, of those went to Hollywood films. Um, and I think that 17% went to uh, Italian films. But one of the reasons for that is because, of course, during the war, um, the Italian film industry was essentially destroyed or put on, put on hold. Um, Cinecittà, which is in Rome, which is the Roman Hollywood, uh, became a refugee camp pretty much up until 47. Um, and so, you know, the Italian, it was a hiccup in, in, in Italian film history. Um, and, you know, the Italian government tried to do some things. They passed laws in 49 to try to protect and subsidize the, the, the film industry. Um, so on the one hand, you have this sort of, the, the, the studio system was destroyed. But on the other hand, Hollywood films were really popular in Italy and in Europe. Um, people, I think, have just a natural uh, attraction to melodrama. And, you know, during this period, uh, of American films being shown in uh, European and Italian theaters. You have a lot of melodramas, there's a lot of uh, kind of costume dramas, 
you had um, King Solomon's Mine, it was from 1950. It's sort of like kind of the equivalent of maybe an Indiana Jones type movie. Um, and so for Italian audiences, it was there was a certain amount of escapism to this. You know, you go to see these Hollywood actors. They're you know they're really attractive. They were also in. Um, <coughs> this is the beginning of a lot of kind of popular Italian magazines dedicated to um, you know stars and starlets. Kind of the, the Us magazine equivalent of the, the late 1940s. Um, but and so they were very popular. But I mean, if, if you look at Italian films from neorealism, like you couldn't imagine more polar opposites. Um, neorealism, you know, these films were based on, they had non-professional actors. All the filming was done on location outside of the studio. Um, and the myth mythology of neorealism is that they were done on sort of shoestring budgets, which is actually recent scholarship has shown that to not actually be true. And so, a good contrast that you can see is if you see Rossellini's Open City, which was kind of the f really the first um, neorealist film. It was actually really popular. It was the only one that was really, really popular in Italy at the time. Um, and you compare that to De Sica's Bicycle Thieves, which is, it is a neorealist film, but it's much tighter. Uh, Open City is very grainy, uh, and you can tell that the film stock is kind of inferior, whereas Bicycle Thieves is, is a very tight film. Um, but anyways, so by the end of, you know, by the beginning of the 1950s, Italy is really looking for a new cinematic aesthetic, mostly because, um, I mean, to what extent new realist films ever really became popular with Italian audiences is kind of, it's still uh, in debate. There was a recent book on new realism that claims that as a genre, people actually really liked it. But if you look at the numbers, um, Hollywood films were by and large, you know, they, they were, these were the blockbusters. These were the films that people were actually going to see. Um, so in 1950, just to say a little bit about how Gramsci comes into um, the Italian intellectual sphere, um, Gramsci was first published in Italy in the late 40s. In 47, the letters come out. And then uh, between 47 and 51, you have six volumes um, of the prison notebooks. Now, it's not as... It's not like the prison notebooks as we see them now. Um, they were split into six different categories. So for example, you would have the Risorgimento, in which they had collected every piece of the, uh, of the prison notebooks and put them up under, underneath different themes. Okay? And so the guy, uh, the editor's name was Felice Platone. He was originally criticized because Gramsci was this great martyr, you know, in post-war Italy. Everybody wanted to have Gramsci as their own. And so people saw uh, Platone, who was working for Ainaudi, which is a left-wing, at, at, at the time was a left-wing uh, publishing house, although a major publishing house in Italy. Uh, he was criticized. They said that he had reconfigured the notebooks in such a way as to make Gramsci into this, this, this real f figure of for the for the Italian Communist Party, which is sort of stupid if you think about it, because Gramsci himself uh, founded the Italian Communist Party. Uh, but regardless, um, the book that I'm interested in is in. It came out in 1950. It's called uh, Literature and National Life. And what it is is it's uh, just a collection of Gramsci's literary criticism from the Notebooks. Now there's other writings from the pre-Notebook uh, literary criticism from when he was writing, and there are a lot of theater reviews. But then in the notebooks themselves, there is a lot of, um, you know, he talks about Dante, he talks about Manzoni, and he talks a lot about international literature in the Italian context. And in doing so, he really underlines what he saw as a hybrid aesthetic model that intellectuals had to follow, not necessarily follow. I mean, I hate to make Gramsci into Lukács. You know, Gramsci was very flexible in these things. And I think that he discusses literature in such a way that he talks about a hybrid model in which it, it's a hybrid artistic model, not necessarily limited to literature, in which you had to, on one hand, have a work of art. On the other hand, you wanted something that people were actually going to be interested in. Um, because the problem for him with Italian intellectuals was that the... And I think that it might have been Echo who said this, Italy is like a, a palm desert, you know? You've got the, these intellectuals like Croce, who are these, you know, they, they're these huge minds, 
But then in between them and the, the, the bottom, it's really nothing. And so he was, Gramsci was really trying to figure out a way to connect uh, intellectuals with the populace. And so one thing he talks about a lot is um, writers like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. And how, for example, Crime and Punishment is a, is a book, on one hand, it is, a, it is a, a very philosophical treatise. On the other hand, it's kind of a crime novel. And so um, for Gramsci, he thought that a guy like Dostoevsky was able to meld these two spheres together in a way that, you know, in an artistic form that people would also want to read and not necessarily, you didn't necessarily have to read it on the highest level in order to enjoy it. Um, so in this, that kind of form in mind, think, um, and then considering also the context of Italian cinema dominated by American film, um, I think that Visconti in the 50s, namely in 1954 with this film Senso, begins to make a type of cinema that is both intellectually um, exciting and popularly attractive. Um, Senso, um, which is this brilliant film about, it's really about the, the Italian risorgimento and the way in which um, the ruling classes Italy, which had never had a real revolution like they had in France. And so for Gramsci, he believed that Italian intellectuals just pretended that there was a, a popular revolution that they called the Risorgimento. And in doing so, they simply perpetuated their own political power. Um, so on the one hand, this film, that's what it's about. But on the other, it's basically a, a, a romance between a Venetian noblewoman and a, uh, an Austrian officer. And the film is big in, in, in every way. You know, it, has, it goes from Milan, it opens in Milan's La Scala Theater, which is this opulent, extravagant theater. Um, and it goes to Venice, and there's some scenes in Venetian canals, and then it ends in Verona. And um, so in that, it's very different from neorealism, because the scope is just much larger. The other thing is it was, a depiction of an aristocratic life, which you know was the opposite of neorealism. Um, but what Visconti does, I think, is that he takes from this artistic landscape that's been established by Hollywood films and inserts this historical Gramscian situation, um, and he does that for you know in a number of different ways. One of which is he used uh, really popular actors. His first choice for the lead of the Austrian officer was Marlon Brando. And Marlon Brando, at the beginning of the 50s, he makes Streetcar um, in 51. He makes uh, The Wild One in 53. He said that the reason why he couldn't do Senso uh, was because he was contractually obligated to do On the Waterfront, which was, you know, I think he won an Oscar for that. Uh, and then for the female role, he's going to wanted Ingrid Bergman, who at the time was, she had. She had been a huge actress in the 40s, and then in the 50s, things kind of fell apart for her a little bit because she fell in love with uh, Rossellini, moved to Italy, and had this very controversial uh, relationship with him that I think in the late 50s they, they got divorced. But anyway, she was, she was essentially, I mean, these two, between Brando and Bergman, you're talking about two major popular actors from Hollywood. Um, he ended up with Farley Granger in the, the, the role of the, the Austrian officer. Farley Granger, who, I personally think that he couldn't act himself uh, out of a paper bag, but he was a really big uh, in Hollywood melodramas at the time. And this woman, uh, Alida Valli, who was, she was an Italian actress who actually had a really interesting career. In the 30s, she was in a lot of Italian melodramas. And she ends up in the 60s, she did some films with Bertolucci and, and whatnot. Um, so anyways, he's using these big actors and on this you know, this, this grand scheme of this, you know, big film. And it was a way for, for Visconti, and at the time, he was criticized fiercely by the, the, the Italian Communist Party because he had broken with what they saw as, you know, the true cinema of neorealism. You know, he had gone into history, really, as opposed to talking about contemporary reality. Um, and he was later defended by one guy, uh, Aristarco, who said that he had made uh, what Lukács would call a historical novel. Um, the problem that I have 
just in general with Visconti criticism is people have a tendency to take these real mechanistic uh, approaches to him and say, oh, he's a Gramscian. He has this, this, this. Oh, he's like Lukács. He has this, this, and this. But personally, I just think that Visconti was a, a person who was able to call from these two different spheres uh, in a way that strict theory doesn't really doesn't really explain in a, any kind of satisfying way. So anyways, um, after Senso, Visconti goes on to make this kind of film. Um, he makes in, uh, in 1960, he makes what is a return to sort of uh, neo -real, the neorealist mode in Rocco and his brothers, which if you watch it today, I mean, it, it seems like a neorealist film, but you have to remember that it was the second most popular film in Italy that year, La Dolce Vita being the number one, you know? And so it was, it was really widely popular. And then in 63, he makes uh, The Leopard, which is an adaptation of um, Lampedusa's novel. And that, too, it was with starring Burt Lancaster. That, too, is a, a, you know, a thinking of the Italian Risorgimento in a, a very uh, Gramscian kind of way. So that's basically where I'm at, and um, thanks. I have a question for you. Actually, two questions. The first is about Japanese Marxism. Uh, could you say some more about the situation of Marxism in academia uh, in the 20th century, both pre-World War II and afterwards, um, especially uh, in terms of what people who used Marxism had in mind, like you said, instrumental Marxism. Could you elaborate some more on that and the reasons for that? The second one is also with Japanese Marxism in academia in terms of how were the, um, how was Marxism distributed uh, amongst disciplines? Was it mostly there are very famous economists? How about otherwise in literary criticism and philosophy uh, in those areas? And what were the reasons for, for any such the uh, reasons for divisions what we mean by if there are specific if uh -huh. Marxism for example is restricted in economics uh -huh. uh, what were the reasons for that why not other <coughs> uh, pre-war Marxism initially s starts off with the uh, what uh, what people call westernization I mean as soon as uh, 1868 hits and you have a plethora of translation that's coming in Rousseau has been translated next to Marx. So the first translation of the Marx Communist Manifesto comes out sometime in the late 19th century, co-translated by, uh, what's his name, uh, just lost his name, but it was, he later became a, a narco-syndicalist. So anarchism, Marxism, all of these things are intermeshing very rapidly. But the time when Marxism really comes to the fore as a sort of independent discipline and study or group is really the 1920s, so-called Taisho Democracy when ideas are sort of, it was kind of, relatively speaking, a liberalization of culture. And uh, Marxism, first and foremost, starts off as both investigation into the history, the social structure of Japan. So you're talking about the roots of academic research for the first time, empirically speaking, of what Japan is. Because before then, you were talking about ideologically loaded conceptions of the state. And Marx has taken really lead in pioneering just simple things like em empirical research, how to collect archives. And on the other hand, you have literary Marxists. Uh, in the 20s, there's a huge debate concerning proletarian literature, because for the first time you have uh, uh, people who, for example, go to Hungary and other places, uh, and they really pick up these theories that's coming out of uh, Europe, including Lukács and so on. And they want to practice this in, in Japanese soil. So there's a whole s section of Japanese intelligentsia among them writers who wants to who want to argue that uh, Marxism in, in literature is absolutely valid. And in order to write a good novel, you have to have some, if not socialist realism, some kind of political consciousness or linkage to uh, raising class consciousness. And this is contested by, uh, for example, Kobashi, probably the most important Japanese modern critic, who argues that in order to understand literature, you have to analyze from the perspective of language, first and foremost not from the perspective of commodities as you do in economics. So if you were to do uh, uh, kind of what Marx was doing for economics, critique of political economy, you have to do a critique of uh, the literary language, theory thereof. And this is what Yoshimoto picks up after World War II. So after, 
in the 30s, this kind of goes into underground. I mean, there were a few activists who were trying to organize, but they were largely unsuccessful. A lot of people are jailed, people recant, and they swim to the side of militarism and so on, because most of the Japanese working class are on the side of the war. And after World War II, they come out, and often a lot of these Marxists deny the fact that they were ever opposed to the war. Right? The, the biggest debate that took place after World War II among Japanese intellectuals is over the question of tenko, or conversion, or apostasy. Why did so many people in the 1930s, when uh, a lot of people were fighting fascism, for example, in Spain and other parts of the, uh, Europe, why was there a retreat in the case of Japan? A lot of it was the, the opposite conversion. People went into just accepting the doctrines of the state. And a lot of the post-war Japanese uh, Democrats, Marxists, try to deny this past. And this is really what pissed off Ayushimaru, because he said, you guys are trying to whitewash your past when you were actually, for the war, attacking just uh, any people who were tainted with any kind of collaborationist uh, attitude towards the war. So one of the movements that came out, Marxist, in terms of literature, I mentioned economics, but literature in post-war was, uh, for example, Shinji Honbunga, the New Japanese Literature, a magazine which was trying to make a list of all the different people who collaborated who were writing pro-war poet, po poetry. But some of them who were editing this magazine did it themselves, except they hide it, they concealed it. So Yoshimoto went on an offense, and by analyzing a lot of these, the poetry, of uh, the literary uh, writers, proletarian school of, of writers in the 1930s. And this became the polemic of the 50s for him. So Yoshimoto is starting as a polemicist, essayist, and poet against the mainstream current of the left orthodox. Now, you, you were asking me a little bit about the uh, division of labor among Marxists. So you had all disciplines were really dominated in many different ways by Marxism, philosophy, uh, economics, literature. Uh, Yoshimura's most engagement, being a, a literary critic and also a poet, as he was working in the factory, was mostly with the literary thinkers who were associated with the party. And there's a series of polemics that he has with like, people like Hamada Seiki and other people who are affiliated intellectuals of the, of the Communist Party. And his point is this, his, his, his basic attitude towards Marxist literary criticism is that, uh, because in the, in the 60s, he, he theorizes what Kobashi proposed in the, in the 20s, which was to theorize literary language, Japanese literary language on its own terms. What is beauty for, uh, for what is uh, beautiful language? It's too long a book. And his point was that language and literary expression had an autonomous logic, autonomous structure of experience, if you will, that could not be reduced to economic determinations, which is very similar to what Thompson was arguing in the sphere of history in relation to working class culture. Uh, so this, this kind of went on throughout up until the 60s. A lot of the, the Marxists who were dominant in the intellectual circles uh, were orthodox, they were mechanical in many ways, and, and Yoshimoto was opposed to pretty much all of them. There were a few of them who worked with him and who were sort of his predecessor. Uh, people who were working outside of the mar at the margin of the party and who were very much independent. But uh, even those people, there was breaks and, and disagreements and so on. Um, but since the early 70s, you have this kind of a shift and the paradigm, because the student movement retreats. And so you have uh, increasing numbers of economists and uh, literary critics who are becoming much more interested in non-Marxist modes of thought. Again, a kind of new forms of Westernization. So postmodernism by, by the 1980s becomes the dominant mode of intellectual exchange, uh, even among the left. So I don't know if this answers your question, but uh, it's kind of brief outline of all the trajectories of Marxism. Any other question? I just think that it's uh, more of a comment, but I, I think that there is a, a point around being a Marxist and at the same time like not falling into that very mechanical way of looking at art or that very mechanical way of looking at things in general. I just I think it's a very interesting mm -hmm. subject. Trying to understand better, like, what well, what is it philosophically that's sort of turning Marxism into a religion like that? 
Well, it was always a, a debate too. I mean, it sounds very similar. And then, like in Italy, it was a question of does art have to come from the top down or from the bottom up? And so there's always there's this constant tension between the party and the artists themselves. And so to what extent can the party dictate artistic, you know, aesthetic preferences? They just they can't. It's something that kind of grows more organically. <coughs> Um, and so I think that to a certain extent it's, it's a problem because it creates di di divisions within the party itself. Um, instead, you know, these, these dedicated Marxist artists really needed to be yoked to the movement um, in a more flexible way. You know, you didn't need um, people telling them how to, how to paint, how to write. I have a question about uh, Visconti. Uh, you, you mentioned his treatment and George Mento as being crunchy. What do you mean by that? How, how is this semantic representation crunchy? Well, yeah, it's something I, don't, I didn't really have time to talk about. In that film, basically, I, I, at one level of the film, it, it is this love story between this woman and this man. On the other, it's the idea that she's an aristocrat, she's an Italian aristocrat, who falls in love with this, this Austrian, but it really doesn't matter. He's an aristocrat as well. <coughs> Now, uh, one of the backstories, and actually this is one part that got cut in the, the final, when it went through the censors, was that she has a brother who is a, um, he's kind of like an activist, you know, he's trying to pull together um, a popular group of, of Italians to aid in the fight against the Austrians. And the, uh, there's a scene in which he has a conversation with the Italian general, and the Italian general says, no, 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 we don't want this to become a popular movement. We have our troops, you know, we'll, we'll take care of the Austrians. And the original film was supposed to be called Custosa, which was a, a basically a military failure. Um, and so rather than talk about the Risorgimento as it always had been done as this sort of movement towards the unification of Italy, like a popular movement in which they tried to almost play it off like, um, like the French Revolution. Actually, if you go to Rome today, you can go to the Museum of the Risorgimento. It's free, and they have they've created these apostles of the Italian unification. That, if you actually look at history, and this is this is Gramsci's whole thing was like a guy like Garibaldi, for example, who became this this real symbol of Italian popular um, the the popular struggle. In the end, it was the official part of, of um, the Italian military that they wanted to marginalize Garibaldi because he was becoming too uh, powerful. Um, and so it's about how the Risorgimento was never actually a revolution. It was just something that came from aristocrats. And what was, because uh, I had a question, I kind of lost, I'm kind of paying attention, attempting to what you were saying. But, uh, um, oh yeah, the question was the selection of Hollywood actors mm -hmm. like uh, Marlon Brando and Ian Bird are being unsuccessful. And Bird Likas was successful with uh, uh, the Leopard. Uh, was this something also? I'm just kind of talking out of my ass, but was this Visconti's idea of trying to let's say uh, find a celebrity equivalent of the organic intellectual in the film, or what, what was the reason behind the selection? I don't think so. I think that. On the one hand, it was because um, the way that he ends up with Farley Granger was mm -hmm. that uh, he wanted to make, in order to fund the film, in the mid-50s, the Italian industry was really struggling, he wanted to get f funding from MGM. Mm. And so he kind of was willing to make these deals with them, and they were the ones who would, in the end, make the final decision on who the actor was. Now, they agreed to do Marlon Brando, but he, they couldn't actually get him. But no, you know, and the other, I think that Visconti himself was never, the idea that he would be, he could be a, a organic intellectual is kind of difficult to swallow because mm. he himself was a, an aristocrat um, and, you know, he was this landed Milanese aristocrat. And so looking at him, his biography, you're not going to say he's an organic intellectual. But I think it was for more aesthetic purposes and that like, these figures were people who they were widely known in the Italian popular imagination, mm -hmm. and that he could then use them to uh, make these sort of historical interpretations. Was there, was there a, what was his political orientation? For example, did he have a 
Did he have a relationship with the party? Oh yeah, he was he was a card carrying Marxist. And the other thing is that he was in '56 when tons of Italian intellectuals they leave the party. Um, he stuck with them. You know, he never ever handed in his uh, whatever his party ID card. You mm -hmm. know, he was always very proud of the fact that like, he was a member of the party and he didn't uh, he didn't revolt with the rest of them. And I mean, there were a lot of Italian intellectuals who, because the Italian Communist Party was really wanted to stay in line with uh, the Soviets, mm -hmm. and then a lot of intellectuals in Italy didn't, didn't like that. Either. Well, in the entire world, you know? um, so yeah. But he was, you know, he was a dedicated communist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that uh, Yoshimoto never knew uh, took part in. But uh, you know, I forgot to do this, so I'm just going to do it quickly. But because uh, I was trying to make a point about Yoshimoto's significance in post-war Japan. Uh, when I went back to Japan uh, last year, in the fall, I went to the Kinokuni Bookstore, which is the equivalent of my like Borders or Barnes & Noble here. And all over the walls, I saw these posters for a CD-ROM collection, like 50 lectures. It's one disc by Yoshimoto Takaki. This was the thing I saw, right? The luxury edition, and I, was, I couldn't believe it. Wow, this is cool. And, uh, and the reason for this is in part, the guy, um, uh, Yoshimoto talks to a lot of different people, including filmmakers and, and uh, people who are into Japan animation, people who are part of the public relations industry, let's say. And uh, one guy, uh, this guy is sort of impresario. He was a guru of public relations. Uh, these different insignia advertisement lines that he did. He has his own company. And uh, Itoi Shigesato is his name. Itoi, become very fast friends with Yoshimoto because of his openness to these new different cultural formations in the 1980s and 90s. And he decided to put out this uh, particular uh, book and also CD-ROM. So if you actually go online, uh, Yoshimoto's this particular, this thing, this uh, CD-ROM, it's on just on one disc, 50 lectures, remasters and so on, have made it to the Guinness Book of Records. It's the longest running uh, audio recording by a person. So. Wow. And is it translated? Do they have it in English version? No, it's no. not. It, this is one of the things about a lot of Japanese intellectual thought. It's it's uh, translation seems to go just one direction right. into English very quickly. You have a complete work of a situations in the national or Gramsci or Jean Paul Sartre, but the other direction is almost like percolating in terms of uh, political thought. Uh, we've we've seen translations of people like Takeo Shoshi, who was also or a colleague of Yoshimoto, and also uh, very much sympathetic to the new left. His, his work on modernity being translated by Columbia University Press over earlier generations of uh, philosophers of the Kyoto School, for example, and translated. But Yoshimoto and his generation, uh, at least him, never was interested in advertising himself internationally. So a younger scholar, for example, a guy who was sort of a complete uh, disciple of Yoshimoto initially, in 1960 when the student movement broke out, uh, Karata Koji whose name is fairly well known today because of his books, Architecture's Metaphor, Trans Critique, uh, Origins of Japanese Modern Literature, which has been translated into English through the MIT Press. He, uh, he was enamored of Yoshimoto so much that he actually moved close to his neighborhood. But there was a kind of a break later. And what Karata did with his work was he went to Yale, befriended Paul DeMond, befriended Frank Jameson, who wrote a preface to his book. And uh, he knew how to really have this sort of international network. So unless you do that actively, uh, a lot of Japanese writers and thinkers, unless you're a novelist, and this kind of takes me to a one segue, uh, Yoshimura Takaki's daughter is probably the most famous Japanese writer today, mm -hmm. which is ja uh, Yoshimoto Banana, Yoshimoto Banana, a female writer uh, after Murakami Haruki, uh, read by everywhere, by everybody in Japan. They used to call this a banana phenomena. Most serious literary critics in the United States of Jap Japanese studies don't like her because of its sort of lighthearted superficiality as they perceive it. But uh, when I go to the Japanese bookstores and ask for Yoshimoto Takaki, nobody knows what I'm talking about, who I'm talking about. When I mention her, his daughter's name, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a situation today. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Banana phenomena is also famous in China. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, since my dissertation is on rural development of China, so I, I, I don't know whether you have followed the... Uh, 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 what's the name? Uh, uh, 
Yoshimoto's thought about uh, rural development in Japan, uh, mm. did he view uh, agricultural development in Japan in post-war Japan largely as being dominated by individual family housing uh, with some professional services mm -hmm. uh, provided to them or based on capitalist development mm -hmm. in the rural, rural area development, yeah. especially agriculture? Yeah. What was his views on that? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, I don't know whether the, the dominant mode of production was capitalist or individual farm. Uh, his view was basically capitalist. He was okay. capitalist uh, but one of the things about rural farming is that he really acknowledged the, uh, the, the really progressive or radical nature of the U.S. post-war occupation policy. Because one of the things they did, I mean, they took seriously, MacArthur did, the idea of democratization, even though there was huge censorship of war, propaganda, and militarist documents, and so on, or even martial arts for a while. Uh, they, for example, liberated the communists and liberals and so on from jails and allowed unions to, to flourish, and also try to attack the Zaibatsu, the sort of family conglomerate, which was not successful, but they tried to do that initially. And one successful reform they did was land reform. So the landlord's lands were just divided up into individual farm owners, which was something that Shimon believed that even the Japanese Communist Party would never dare to do because of their, uh, well, com you know, compromised, conformist attitude. But by the time the 1970s and 80s hit, uh, his idea was that Japan had entered into what he, what he called hyper-capitalist moment, meaning that, meaning that more than half of the income of uh, average Japanese are now are loaded to consumer goods. That is not necessary, like electronics or movies, entertainment, etc. So this means that the, there's a shift from industrial capitalism to consumer capitalism, and in that shift, the working class uh, agency has radically shifted to the consumer agency. So you have to rethink the basis of uh, orthodox Marxism. That was one one of the points he made. And at that moment, obviously, when even industry was kind of being re left behind, the ruler communities was. Um, his idea was the ruler communities, some people wanted to remain farmers because we have this kind of mass flux in Japan. A lot of people wanted to leave the, the country and go to the, go to the town and city and become sararima, you know, wage workers or work for a big company. And the question was, how do you maintain some of these traditional Japanese uh, farming communities? And his idea was, well, the state should subsidize if people want to stay. But it's really understandable in his view that the people just want to leave. He didn't have a, any kind of attachment to a sort of peasant uh, economy. Uh, although one of his closest colleagues was this guy called Tanigawa Gaku, sort of charismatic coal mining organizer. He was a Maoist and so on. But uh, he, his view was that you have to go to the country. And that was where the basis of the Asian commune was. And Ishimura completely disagreed with this. So he was one of the, if you will, uh, people, intellectuals in Japan who appreciated critically the, the possibilities of consumer capitalism. Wait, has that, uh, this idea of going back to yeah. the rural areas, has that picked up again, or no? No, not really, not really. Uh, for the longest time, I think we see, still see that. There was, as Steve was talking to one of my students there, talking to uh, one of my friends about the uh, different Japanese villages he visited. Uh, and there's very much still existing villages and custom and practice and traditional festivals and so on. But if you compare this to a situation that's like 34 years ago, it just, Diminishing just rapidly. Uh, Don Rishi, a uh, sort of semi Orientalist uh, writer on Japan who sort of went through the U.S. occupation, stayed there, wrote cultural criticism and so on. He's very fond of the 1945, 46, 50s Japan because of its traditional landscape and ecology, which is all but gone in many ways. A lot of old people, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? What happened to the so two panelists? So yeah. how, how, how was this well. panel formed? So did you know each other? Uh, did, were, were they in touch with the, the two speakers who were born out here? This is the first time I, I met a brand oh, new. Yeah, it's a pleasure, though. Yeah, it's so an absolute yeah. pleasure for me, too. So who puts the panel together? You? This is no, no, no. no. We, 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 uh, we proposed it, and somebody would oh, put it together. Right. So you proposed your own article? Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, as uh, abstracts and so on, yeah. Right. Are you working? This is for your dissertation? Yeah, for a dissertation. Cool. So I just started, but. Yeah. It's we'll a really intriguing topic. Because I've always been interested in.
tell me problems with yeah. you know, half and half and off the lane and stuff. I just, you know, watch a bunch of stuff back you know, growing up. Oh, yeah, well, it's funny because at this conference, I've seen so much talk about Gramsci this yeah, and Gramsci yeah. that, but, you know, in the 60s, all those great political films in Italy, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, if you like to see this stuff fleshed out um, on screen, like, there, there's really a lot of good directors who, mm. and also, I think the Italian the original interpretation of Gramsci was really different, a different mm -hmm. Gramsci than we have now, uh, because it wasn't filtered through, I mean, it's the Brits, really, that popularized um, Gramsci in the, the Anglo-American world. That's right, like people like Perry Anderson mentioned, he was the one to import Gramsci ideas into England. Right. But uh, how did you uh, get it, decide to pick this topic? Was it I, you know, I was doing, um, I, I did mostly literature, and then uh -huh. Visconti made, all of his films are literary adaptations. Um, and so I was interested in how you adapt the literary model into the cinema that is also mm. historically resonant. Mm. Um, and it's an interesting problem in Italy because, and this Gramsci said as well, was that you know, like Italy always had a real literary culture, mm. but it was one that never was able to make it down, trickle down to the masses. And I think that Visconti was really able to make these big popular films that also had uh, a certain literary weight to them. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it fell into yeah. Is, is the Hollywood domination of the yeah. film industry or film uh, distribution still true? Oh yeah, yeah. And the problem is now, like Italians have, they found their niche, you know, and they make these. Uh, not all of them. Yeah, yeah. There's actually this guy, Matteo Garone. He does. Uh, he did this film, Gomorra. Okay. That came out. Um, it's based <coughs> on a book. He 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 does these weird dark thrillers that that I really like. Mm. Um, but well, for the most part, Italian domestic filmmaking is a lot of. Kind of romantic Hi. comedies. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Payne. Oh, oh. Well, you are you on? Cummings. Uh, just coming up or? The one coming up. Okay, okay. okay. cool. Yeah, we're done. Oh, well, you're done? No, yeah. I just think put that stuff down. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks,